Hey everyone, Dave Reviews here. So every time I look at a Crash Bandicoot ranking list, they usually revolve around the games, the bosses, and the levels. However, I'm here to do something a little different by focusing exclusively on the Titans duology, specifically the mutants crash controls in the games. These monstrosities might be abhorred by the Crash fanbase, but in a lot of ways, they stay true to the idea of Crash Bandicoot, especially considering how a lot of them are a hybrid of different animals. But obviously, each of them have their own strengths and weaknesses, which makes some of them better than others. The only rules I'd place on this list include they cannot be bosses, so no Crunch, no Arachnina, no Uka Uka, and they have to be jackable, meaning that the little minions don't count. So without further ado, Let's get started in ranking all of the Titans from both Crash of the Titans and Mind Over Mutant. <laughs> so I was having a lot of trouble figuring out who would be at the bottom of this list. Of the Titans that I really disliked, it kind of narrowed down to the Stench and the Gore. The Gore suffers from slow mobility. However, if there was one thing that puts the former underneath the latter, it's the fact that the Stench is basically a worse copy-paste of the Snipe. Unlike the other projectile-based titans that have bullets that travel at the speed of light and in a linear path, the stench's stink blasts tend to go in an arched direction. This causes the accuracy of the bullets to be a bit iffy because it makes them bounce off of solid objects, especially if the enemy is standing on higher elevation. So in this instance of episode 12, Weapons of Mass Construction, the bullets are clearly having a lot of trouble hitting the radicle because the arch they travel in will make them reflect off the platform despite the radicle being placed on a specific target. Not to mention that the stench's stink blasts take a longer time to hit their enemy when compared to the feather darts of the snipe or the volts of the e-electric. It doesn't really affect his gameplay too much, but it does make the stench less exciting to control because of how tedious his shooting style is. He really is just gradually mowing down enemies with his sluggish stink blasts, whereas both the snipe and the electric quickly eviscerates them with their more vertical and faster moving shots. Finally, and maybe this is a little nitpicky, but the stench takes quite a bit of damage, even from the ordinary minion. In fact, it's probably the weakest titan in terms of durability, with a simple Doom Monkey taking out at least a third of his health. If there are any redeeming factors I can think of, it is that Mind Over Mutant improves on the stench by making a special attack feature in passing gas, like a skunk, instead of that boring three-shot move he does in Titans. However, other than that, he still has the same issues as his predecessors. Also, why do spacesuits? I cannot make the connection with skunks, vultures, and outer space. Does it have something to do with how in the description Aku Aku describes the stench as a thing, as if it was an unknown alien race? This black and white bird thing. If you think about it, all these mutants are of some alien entity, so seriously radical, what was your thinking here with this design? It looks less like a vulture skunk hybrid, and more like an astronaut that happens to be a furry. <laughs> As hinted at before, Dagor is the second worst titan in the duology. This mutant falls into the same category as the Scorporella and the Shellephant in the sense that it's more focused on brute strength and less about fast movement. However, while the Scorporella and the Shellephant have the ability to chain together devastating melee combos in quick succession, Dagor isn't as speedy with its reflexes. This of course leaves it open to getting stunlocked when it's surrounded by several other enemies, since while it's able to hit really hard, you can't attack swiftly enough. And of course, moving around on Dagor isn't any better. While the Scorporella and the Shellephant gave me a sense of power with their hulking frame and knuckles digging into the earth, Dagor crawls at the speed that it took to count all the Florida votes in Bush v. Gore. And sadly, there are quite a few instances where you have to react quickly with the gore to avoid enemy fire, and it just doesn't move fast enough. And then there's its special ability, which is basically him unleashing a terrifying roar at his foe to freeze them in place. Overall, while it's useful in a lot of situations, it doesn't have much of a range, and often I found that I have to move close to an enemy for it to have an effect. When fighting against a Yuctopus, I had to close the distance with the beast just to use it, which isn't good because the boss might perform its own shockwave attack to immobilize you in place, 
and de Gore being as slow as it already was, that was almost impossible to escape. But that being said, de Roar is very effective when it does hit, for it lasts long enough for you to deliver some hard-hitting blows to knock a Titan out. I just wish that it cover a larger area. At the end of the day, it's a horrible to control Titan with some good attributes surrounding it. <laughs> for number 13, we have the E-Electric. It's sad that a lot of these projectile titans are copy-paste of the same snipe model, and this one is no exception. Although what makes it a marked improvement over the stench is that its electric blasts fire in a more vertical direction instead of an arch like the latter. It makes it a lot easier to shoot at targets accurately, as well as giving the bullets more speed when traveling. I also give Radical Entertainment kudos for trying to be a bit more creative with this one, at least stylistically speaking. There's a lot you can do with electric-based titans, and for its super attack, instead of shooting three shots all at once like the snipe and the stench, the E-Electric will shoot into the sky and rain down several lightning strikes on its foes. I don't think it does any more damage compared to the three-shot strike attack, but there's always something devastatingly godlike about raining lightning from the heavens to decimate your enemies. However, while it was really creative in style, gameplay-wise, the E-Electric is nothing special. There could have been different uses for the E-Electric besides combat. Maybe some of the levels could have provided a switch or button that he needs to activate in order to progress. Electricity is such a versatile element and Radical Entertainment basically missed their opportunity when it came to using this titan inventively outside of combat. Arguably, you could say all of the titans were limited to only fighting, and thankfully Mind Over Mutants improved over this, but with the E-Electric, it's especially upsetting because I could see several different ways that its powers could have been used, but instead, the developers took the safe route. Maybe this titan could have been higher up in the list if Radical had addressed this, and provided a variety of situations for the electric to use its volts, but alas, what we got is what we got. <laughs> the spike is a little weird for me. It's the first titan that Crash meets, so of course its spectacle is maybe not as impressive compared to some of the other beasts, but for the most part, it controls well. Its mobility is very fast, so it doesn't feel like a chore moving around like the gore, and its special attack of raising spikes out of the ground has some decent area that it can take out several enemies at once. I might even say that its simple melee move of slashing enemies in quick succession not only makes it viable to racking up large hit combos to get that Combo King requirement, but it's also very satisfying with the sound effects of its claws scraping into its opponent's flesh. I guess the only thing that makes me not like this one as much as the others, and this might sound like a bit of a strange reason, but it's relatively generic. When you have other monsters that can create a trail of ice to freeze its enemies, or shoot blasts of feathers to dice up your foes, or use its trunk as a stationary flamethrower, the spike kind of has nothing really interesting going for it. Like I said, it's the first one we meet, so maybe I shouldn't be too hard on it, but its whole gimmick of raising spikes out of the ground loses its luster after a while. The only reason it's higher than some of the other ones on this list is that mechanically, it's very sound. It never felt frustrating to use like the stench and the gore, it's just a bit on the boring side. And once again, Mind Over Mutant does make some improvements to the spike, such as being able to sharpen its needles like a regular porcupine, as well as having a leap attack that involves it curling into a ball as it lunges at its opponents to pierce it with its needles. So yeah, Definitely far from a bad titan, just one that didn't make much of an impression. <laughs> Jumping to Crash Mind Over Mutant, number 11 is the TK. Honestly, in concept, this titan is probably the most innovative that Radical has created in the duology. His gimmick is to use telekinesis to throw objects or move switches. So unlike any of the other titans, the TK is usually used for traversal purposes and progressing through the stage instead of gaining the upper hand in combat. However, that's its greatest weakness. The TK doesn't really have much of an offensive attack. Sure, it can charge up a Mind Blast, and it can toss enemies around, but it's sadly limited to that. Additionally, the Telekinesis power requires that the TK stand still, which leaves it open to getting attacked. This is actually the downside to fighting against Crunch, because while throwing TNT crates at the turret is a lot of fun to do, the fact that the telekinesis leaves it stationary allowed the boss to squeeze in a shot. In my Crash of the Titans review, I complained about how the mutants were not applicable for anything outside of combat, but the TK is on the other extremity. 
While it's very useful in solving some of the levels as puzzles and interacting with the environment, it's not as good at combat as it could have been. Although, I will say this. I do think that he is one of the Titans that has the most amount of personality attached to him. Most of the Titans are depicted as simple monsters. However, when you first encounter the TK, the first thing he does is do the moonwalk. As cheesy as it might be, it makes the TK out to be a character instead of just another generic mind-numbing beast. And the little scuttling sound that he makes whenever he runs around almost makes it seem as if he's excited to get into action. These might seem like little things, but they do make the TK feel unique compared to the other Titans, at least in terms of its characterization. And the overall design of a bird embryo inside of a bubble looks very Mysterio-esque, for lack of a better word, and is a nice break from the overall bestial looks of all the other mutants. Sadly, its faults get in the way of what is otherwise a very fun Titan to control. <laughs> Coming in at number 10 is none other than the original Sharpshooter. Not a carbon copy like his successors, the Snipe is a pretty interesting hybrid in and of itself, for it's an amalgamation of a fox and a parrot. Like, I cannot come to terms with how they come up with such bizarre combinations. But then again, the same can be said with mixing King Kong with a koala bear. Overall, its gimmick sets it apart from all the other Titans in the game, and there are only two others that are like it, both of whom we've already talked about in this list although the snipe has the shooting mechanic at its most refined. The bullets move at a quick speed, and the popping sound that results from their impact really helps you feel the velocity of these feathered blasts. And I'm serious when I mention feathers. Just look at the description. This colorful creature prefers to keep its distance and throw razor-sharp feathers to slice you up like warm cheese. Of course, being a more ranged attacker comes at a cost. The snipe has only one melee attack in its arsenal, that being the ability to launch onto enemies with its spare claws and scratch them. Other than that, good luck if you're surrounded by a pack of spikes and can't do anything, so the snipe is at its best when attacking from afar, and they really pushed this idea of being a ranged attacker to its fullest with its special ability. Locking onto three or four targets will cause the snipe to leap into the air and to fire several blasts at multiple targets at once. It's very effective, especially if you don't want to take out certain unsuspecting minions one at a time. However, Mind Over Mutant takes this even further by having the snipe go full-on rapid fire like it's wielding a feather-loaded machine gun. You can imagine just how satisfying this was to use. If you don't feel like just firing one at a time to slowly fill up that stun bar meter, how about doing in a jiffy with the feather gun-toting snipe? <laughs> so we're starting to get into the positives with this list, with the next Titan being the Battler. The Battler is indeed a very quality Titan. The fact you get it late game shows that it's one of the more powerful mutants that is difficult to jack. It's able to chain together a three-hit melee combo that can leave something as immense as the Scorporilla within a cinch of its health and his special attack of unleashing cyclones and body-slamming his enemies really does a number on them. So why isn't he higher? Well, the main reason behind this has to do with how long it takes to charge up your attacks. Now, for the most part, all the heavy attacks have this issue where charging up usually leaves them open to getting pummeled. But with the Battler, it was especially noticeable. Maybe because it had something to do with the fact that its animation for its heavy and special attacks often were a little bit more involved. While most other Titans merely had to energize a ground pound, the Battler had to rise up into the air and charge up to do its glide ability and absorb a lot of wind to unleash its cyclones. These little details with the animation made the charge up time feel lengthier than it should have been, and caused my cyclones and glide dashes to be interrupted more often than not. There is a point during this time that they gain invincibility frames, but it's not quite clear as to when that kicks in. And the Battler is the Titan that I describe as being resilient to taking damage either. Because of its strong attacks mixed in with its vulnerability, the Battler is a glass cannon, if anything else. It can make pretty good knockout punches, as long as it manages to not get knocked out itself. So I know what you all are thinking. Yes, this is technically a boss mutant. However, Mind Over Mutant has this guy traveling around on foot into regular levels, so to me, he counts as a normal titan. His stamina supersedes all the other mutants, being able to sustain itself even when a bunch of Grimleys and Spikes try to gang up on it. The sad thing about the Octopus 
that maybe prevents it from being higher in this list has a lot to do with the fact that its usage is limited to combat situations. Granted, this guy is like a walking tank, but even in Mind Over Mutant, where most of the Titans can jump and ledge grab to platform, the Octopus being only useful in specific situations prevented me from liking this guy more. Basically, he only appears towards the tail end of Mount Grimly, where you have to smash the generators that are keeping you from getting access to Uka Uka, and that's it. You can't take him outside that area, because Crash can't put him inside his pocket. In a lot of ways, his great strength comes with its fair share of limitations. But while he's only useful for crushing, Radical definitely took the liberty of making sure that causing as much destruction as possible was fun. He can charge a laser cannon that unleashes a devastating beam, and the unsuspecting Titan that walks into it is almost guaranteed to be stunned. He can also release a bagpipe ripple to freeze other mutants in place. Perhaps because it was so powerful, maybe that's why Radical Entertainment wouldn't let you put these guys in your pocket and travel around with it, because that'd be making the game too easy. And this wouldn't be complete if I didn't say anything about its design. It's a combination of a yak, a duck, and an octopus with bagpipes on its back. I mean, in the original series, you had some bizarre combinations like a dingo and a crocodile, but this amalgamation is so otherworldly that it's amazing that this thing even was conceived. Not to mention that its bagpipe song just makes you want to plug your ears with several wads of tree bark to keep the cacophony from ruining your eardrums. Well, if it isn't the mutants featured on the box art of Crash of the Titans, the Ratskull is probably one of those mutants that I'd consider to be the closest to being an all-rounder. It moves at a relatively fast speed, so you're not just bulldozing at a sluggish pace like the Gore and the Yuctopus. It has a slash attack for its regular melee move, which can be combined to do easy-to-perform combos on enemies, and its special attack of creating a trail of ice to freeze his foes is very useful in mob fights so long as you yourself don't get caught up in it, then it's more of an annoyance than an amelioration. And in Mind Over Mutant, they make this guy even better with his new sneeze ability that can freeze bodies of water to create platforms for him to jump across. Not to mention that this and the TK are the only Titans to really exemplify any form of personality outside of being a fearsome beast. For there is one scene in Crash of the Titans where the Ratsicle is in the shower, bathing. Hell, if you look closely enough, you might catch it sitting on a toilet in one section while a Doom Monkey spins next to it. I know it's a little weird that they choose bathroom scenes to describe the guy's character. It might even be a little cringy, but at least it gives more life to the Ratsicle instead of just stomping their feet at Crash or jumping off a high ledge and roaring. But there is one fundamental flaw with the Ratsicle, and that's the fact he's just an imitation of the Spike. Dare I say it, he comes across as a little bit too similar, at least in terms of controls. If you pay attention to his running animation and slash attack, it looks eerily familiar to the same moves as the latter. Maybe it's not too offensive, but it does make you wonder why Radical couldn't come up with something more original for this guy, at least with the animations. It almost sort of feels like they were running out of ideas. Even the ice trail it unleashes does seem very similar to the Magmadon's special move. Maybe it's kind of nitpicky, but considering all the other Titans have their own unique running and fighting style, it's almost like they got lazy with the Ratsicle and made him almost to be a reskinned Spike. Their designs also look kind of similar with both of them bearing their front teeth. But I've ratted on long enough. Moving back to the area of the Hulking Beasts, the Shellephant is another one of those hybrid creatures. I initially thought he was just a mutated elephant with shells sticking out. However, after doing a light research on the Crash Bandicoot wiki, I was able to figure out that he was actually merged together with a crab. And you can tell this by the fact his underbelly looks rather crustacean. And as already implied, the Shellephant is no normal elephant. As soon as it bursts forth from his cage, you'll immediately notice that the guy has four-fingered hands instead of the typical elephant feet that are so common in the savannah. Maybe you would have thought that these should have been pinchers, since it's also half crab, but no bother, for the shellephant makes good use of these fists with the ground pound. In fact, 
You could infinitely punch with careful timing of the light attack button, and the Shelfant becomes a walking armored assault tank as it slams its fists into everything in its path. So far, so satisfying. However, it can only attack enemies that are directly in front of it, so a certain spike standing behind him can do a single swipe to interrupt the Shelfant's endless combo. Although, this is mitigated with its heavy and special attacks. The heavy attack basically is the Shelfant making a massive sweep with its trunk, which can attack most of the enemies in front because of its wide radius. It can also turn its trunk into a living flamethrower and scorches enemies while spinning in a stationary position. Overall, the second best heavy hitter Titan if it wasn't overshadowed by the Scorporilla. If there were any problems that I had with it, it'd probably be that it does move kind of slow. So considering that Tiny's levels are filled with lumberjack activities, it's pretty easy for him to get stunlocked by a saw for a brief period of time. But sometimes the slow speed is used for climactic effect, like in the boss fight against Tiny. There's just something mesmerizing as the hulking Shelephant slowly walks down a pathway towards the boss while smashing barriers in his way. Oh. So these last five Titans on the list are what I'd probably consider to be the best in the duology. They are the definitive mutants that come to the closest in checking all the boxes for me, starting with none other than the Rhino Roller himself. Basically, he's a hybrid of a Rhino, an Armadillo, and a Lion. Therefore, his specialty is rolling around Sonic the Hedgehog style. Its main gimmick is that it tumbles through the level at a fast pace, smashing everything and everyone that dares cross its path. It's probably the only Titan I can think of that has its own gameplay style outside of the regular combat. In the areas where Crash would normally use the board slide, if you have one of these guys jacked, you can roll through the pathway instead of riding it out on Aku Aku. It doesn't quite add anything terribly new to the experience, but it's at least an innovation that the other Titans don't have. However, after a certain amount of time, the Rhino Roller will drain all its mana, which will cause it to stop and walk at a slow pace. And this isn't like the hulking frame of the Scorporilla, he's literally just crawling on all fours like the Gore. What's worse is that his main melee move is just him thrusting his head into the air for a slow headbutt. To describe it, the Rhino Roller is like finishing three Sour Patch Kid slushies. It tastes really good when drinking it, However, after you've finished, you might have a stomach ache with a little bit of guilt mixed in. Thankfully, Mind Over Mutant was able to fix this by having the Rhino Roller move around in a ball for the entire time, so you never had to put up with a slow-ass walking dinosaurian landmass ever again. <laughs> Unlike the rest of the turtle species that prefers to stay in the cool recesses of the sea, the Magmadon seems to prefer the hot, warm lava. This is one of the few element-based titans that can survive areas that would otherwise be hazardous to crash. In the Magmadon's case, he's able to walk around in the molten liquid, whereas Crash would get toasted. But the main attraction with this titan is its own physical strength. After launching one overhand strike, the Magmadon can perform a gut punch to its enemies. Not only does it really fill up its stun meter, but it just feels really cathartic to do. The way that the punch quickly catapults out of the Titan to knock back its opponent provides a certain oomph that the other normal attacks from the other Titans don't give. Its special attack is also guaranteed to knock out its enemy of all sizes and chain together a solid amount of combos. Oh look, it's the Shelephant. Looks like I'm fucked. Oh well, that was easy. If I could apply to saying size doesn't matter, it'd be to the Magmadon. Its trail of magma can take out even the biggest of the giants. Too bad I took this away in Mind Over Mutant in favor of a spinning attack. It's probably one of the few I'd argue that the sequel did worse. <laughs> For once, there's a mutant that isn't an amalgamation of animals. Granted, maybe the TK fulfilled that role, but even with that one, there was a little bird embryo inside the body. The Grimly is a ghost-looking creature of unknown origin. However, it's not intangible in the slightest. In fact, he makes sure his enemies know that he's rock solid. The Grimly has the fastest melee ability of all the Titans, considering he punches them at a very rapid pace. Sure, maybe mashing the square button is mindless, but it does a good job of giving that serotonin and dopamine. Also, it has the ability to slow down time, 
which is not only good for navigating platforming sections, but also for leaving enemies incapacitated long enough to stun them. All that's weighing down to Grimly is its heavy attack. It requires you to energize a punch before he slams his fist against his adversary. Similar to what I said about the Battler, it just takes 1,000 years for it to charge that it's just enough time for another mutant to interrupt it. But other than that, the Grimly is one of the best titans to control because he has the most balanced usefulness between both combat and navigation. If only he could bring that heavy attack out faster, he would have been perfect. <laughs> yeah, I know I probably pissed off a lot of people with this placement. The Scorporilla has a lot of things going for it. Its tail whip attack that it does as a finisher has quite the range that it can knock out multiple titans instantaneously. Just look at this shit. The radius is so great that any titan standing several yards away will get blown off their feet by the flaming scorpion tail. Again, it might be more button mashing oriented, but Radical really mastered the massive brute with the Scorporilla. I could just swipe away the strongest of mutants as if they're nothing. The ground pound that it does also has quite a range. Almost every single mutant standing in the arena just gets decimated as soon as her fists hit the ground. Yes, you might expect me to complain about the Scorporilla's slow speed, but at least the animators had the liberty of making her look terrifying while walking. This isn't any hapless crawling tortoise like all the other giants were. The Scorporilla literally looks like she's stalking the earth in all her majesty as it walks. Her shaking form is literally one of dominance. And if there's anyone wondering if I'm assuming her gender, Aku Aku confirms it in the bio. Stay sharp, Crash, and watch out for her gargantuan arms, crushing feet, and her huge scorpion tail. Maybe you should just stay away from her altogether, okay? Overall, she truly is girl boss material, for lack of a better word. However, there's one titan I like better. Oh. A little bit of an odd choice, perhaps. You wouldn't expect a mutant that's described as the common cold come to life to be my favorite titan in the Titans Mind Over Mutant duology, but here we are. Everything about the sludge feels so refined and smooth. There is no long wind-up time or anything like that for its strong offensive moves. Granted, the clap attack does require some amount of charging up, but thankfully the sludge provides other ways to break enemies' blocks, like jumping out of the ground while performing an uppercut. This monster has the ability to go underground and move around instead of having a traditional defensive maneuver, so it has a means of escape if it's trying to dodge an attack it can't avoid. Sure, maybe the battler can shuffle around while blocking, but it's not the same as having this much momentum with the sludge. Even something as simple as the regular slap attack it does not only deals a lot of damage, but it also has a lot of range that it can hit enemies at quite a distance. I mean, I sort of gave this praise to Scorporilla's tail whip attack, but that was only a finisher. For the sludge, all three of your basic attacks in a three-hit combo can hit the farthest of foes. And then, there's its barf attack, which is super effective because you can move around while firing it. This means that you can push the enemy backwards, allowing you to further assert your advantage on your opponent. This titan truly is the GOAT, which is probably why it's so hard to jack. I'm serious when I say that the sludge can give Crash quite the beating, and whenever there were groups of them, it became all the more difficult, so much so that there were a lot of controller-tossing moments when fighting these guys. However, it makes it all the more rewarding once you learn the awesome powers you get to wield. And yeah, that was that. All the titans ranked, excluding bosses, that is. Overall, I'm surprised I had a lot more to say than I actually thought I did. I guess it goes to show how much people overlook the titans games. At first glance, these games might not look like much and seem as if they ruined Crash Bandicoot, but looking deeper into them, they can be very complex and quite scintillating to discuss. At least in my case, anyway. Well, I don't want this going on for longer than it needs to be, so thanks for watching, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and I will see you later.